Community Church. We are a family focused on Christ. We want to know God. About the revelation of God. The first one was about the people of God being redeemed, and this one is about what they've learned about their God that rescued them out of slavery. And so, why are you guys standing here? Well, don't you know, this is this is a great time to start a group, Ray. It is, Ray. It's a gravity friends group. So, the three of us could make a group. We, 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 we can bring Philip. We Philip. No, that would be three friends. That would be three friends. Well, you could grab, can you grab three friends? You can you grab can. three friends. Okay, I'm in. Now, now it's four of us. Yeah. So, if so, you want to start a group, you go, just need to go, go online here. to go the here. grab two friends groups and sign up we'll give you a coach and everything you need to start a group with your friends we can't wait to start this new series with your guys we're ready let's go all right what's up y'all this is your student pastor malcolm here saying that we have an amazing summer trip to the twin cities it's our mission trip and we're really excited because if you want to learn how to be a servant leader if you want your kids to really grow closer to christ and do it in a way that's practical and they really can just wake up um, their faith all those good things this is a time to do it this is a trip to do it we are so excited for it so we're going to be going the 9th to the 19th of june and i'm going to talk to you not as a pastor or a family pastor but as the father of one of the students this is a priority trip for us as a family because I know for a fact, having gone on seven or eight Lead 222 trips already with students, including my son once before, that this trip will be a pivot point in his life. We are making it the priority trip for the summer because he's gonna learn how to be a leader, he's gonna learn how to love Jesus, he's gonna make some great friends, and to be honest with you, he's gonna have a blast. So sign your kid up today. Sign it up, we wanna see him, let's go. I'm rolling. <laughs> Philip, guess what? What, right? We are doing a new series called Exit Us. It's actually the second part of a three-part series that we're doing that is about the book of Exodus. This particular chapter is about the revelation of God. The first one was about the people of God being redeemed, and this one is about what they've learned about their God that rescued them out of slavery. And so, why are you guys standing well, here? Don't you know, this is this is a great time to start a group, Ray. It is, Ray. It's a grab two friends group. So, the three of us could make a group. We, 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 we can, can bring Philip. We, can Philip. No, that would be three friends. That would be three friends. Well, you could grab, can you grab three friends? You can you grab can. three friends. Okay, I'm in. Now, now it's four of us. Yeah. So, so, if you want to start a group, you go, just need to go, go online here. to go the here. grab two friends groups and sign up. We'll give you a coach and everything you need to start a group with your friends. We can't wait to start this new series with your guys. We're ready. Let's go. 
All right, what's up, y'all? This is your student pastor, Malcolm, here, saying that we have an amazing summer trip to the Twin Cities. It's our mission trip, and we're really excited because if you want to learn how to be a servant leader, if you want your kids to really grow closer to Christ and do it in a way that's practical and they really can just wake up um, their faith, all those good things, this is the time to do it. This is a trip to do it. We are so excited for it. So we're going to be going the 9th to the 19th of June, and I'm going to talk to you not as a pastor or a family pastor, but as the father of one of the students. This is a priority trip for us as a family because I know for a fact, having gone on seven or eight Lead 222 trips already with students, including my son once before, that this trip will be a pivot point in his life. We are making it the priority trip for the summer because he's gonna learn how to be a leader, he's gonna learn how to love Jesus, he's gonna make some great friends, and to be honest with you, he's gonna have a blast. So sign your kid up today. Sign it up, we wanna see him, let's go. Hey, he's like, Pastor right here. Can you all with me inhale? Exhale. The reason why I'm asking you to do this is because maybe that's the first time you've been able to do that this week. Maybe your week has been filled with stress. Maybe your week has been filled with joy. Whatever your week has been, God has delivered you from that week to this very day. And for what? We're starting this new series called Exit Us, where we are talking about where God has delivered his people to and why did he do it? And now for you, he's delivered you here to worship him as a way of celebrating what he's delivered us from. So as you prepare to worship, as the band gets ready, would you consider what he's delivered you from and worship from that place? I love it. Would you guys stand with us? We just kind of wanted to start the morning. There's just some applause in here. Maybe this is praise applause for God. If you're comfortable, you can just say hallelujah. But praise the Lord, just kind of do. Come on, don't be shy. We came here to praise Him. Here we go. Come on, just put your hands together. All right, let's sing this together. Your word is a lamp. Your word is a lamp unto my. But I want to be on it, yeah. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide. Because you're good on your promise.
I am because the I am tells me who I am. I mean, that's catchy, right? But let's just think about that for a second. You are who you are because when God looks at you, he doesn't say, oh, oh, that's my, that's, that's my mistake over here. Oh, that's my sinner over here. Oh, that's my cheater over here. Oh, that's the, the person that did this. That, oh, that's my gospel. When he looks at you, he says, I have made them righteous through my son Jesus, and that is my child. Isn't that crazy? And so what we do is we worship out of that. When you know some people come into church and they're really scared, they're like, oh, man. Here we go, like the roof could fall in because I'm here. But the reality is, is that when you come to church, when you come to encounter God anywhere, He is right there with you, for you. He's not there judging you, saying, well, it's about time. He's there saying, yes, let's party. <laughs> I'm so excited that you're here. Let's, let's do this. Let's worship together. And so this is a communion moment where we meet with holiness. Does that make sense? This is big what happens in this room. So I want you to feel freedom this morning. I want you to feel comfortable just to tell God how much you love him, okay? And let's make some declarations this morning at the same time. This is a song of declaration and understanding. God is for you. Everything in him is proud of you and ready to move you towards being like his son. Let him turn it in your favor. Watch him work it for your good. He's not done with what he started. That's you. He's not done until it's done. We just got to say that again one more time. Say. Let him turn it in your favor. Watch him work it for your good. He's not done with what he started. He's not done until it's good. Receive this. Hello peace, hello joy, hello love, hello strength, hello hope, it's a new horizon. Hello peace, hello joy, hello love, hello strength, hello hope, it's a new horizon. If you're ready for a breakthrough, Amen. just open up and just receive. Cause what he's pouring out is nothing you've ever seen. seen. You've ever seen. seen.
you are heartbreaks not my home you are you are God death is not the end you are amen let's just say God we want to remember this morning that even the things in our lives that might feel like death or they might feel like pain or we just don't love it maybe God we trust you with it this morning and we put faith and we say this is not the end this could possibly be the beginning of something new you're trying to do in my life so God basically we just submit our lives to you in faith and we trust you that every single thing that you do is good so we say hello to peace let this room resound with love with joy with hope with healing with all these things that we long for they're not found anywhere other than you and god let us take that and spread it everywhere we go we pray that we ask that in jesus name we love you god we said together amen can we just applaud our lord in here god we're grateful for your peace your hello your love your hope amen you can have a seat for just a moment isn't god awesome I hope that when you come here, you feel like really comfortable. Do you feel comfortable? You can lie to me, say yes. We want you to feel really comfortable because this is like a living room. It's not, it's not anything to be intimidated by. It's something to enjoy in the presence of God. But we wanted to tell you about some stuff that's coming up, some really fun stuff. One of them is, now I'm competitive. We, I'm not good at things, but I act like I am. So it's like it's he my talks thing. a good game. I talk a big game. I'm not planning on a stopping. great game, actually. A great game. Yeah. yeah, you do. You do. So if you're over 60, chances are you're twice as fun as everybody younger than you, and we know that. We believe that. We know that. This is true. And so this coming Wednesday, we're celebrating experience. So if you're over 60, we're doing a game night. Yep. And we're challenge. The pastors are going to be challenging them. Mm -hmm. I'm just calling you out. If you're over 60, I'm ready to take you down. So come on out, because I'm not messing with I'm not going to say, I'm not going to have any sympathy. I'm going hard. I'm going to beat them. It's going to be competitive. We all know how this is going to work out, right? <laughs> We're not stopping till somebody cries. That's when we know the games are over. Is that what we want to invite people out to? <laughs> Until yeah, see, somebody like cries? The people are going to show up. They're going to be there. But, of course. But this is only if you're over 60. If you're not over 60, just... That's the true. time is coming. It's, it's, it's the celebrate experience folk versus the pastors. So yeah. we're already handicapped, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so there is that. And then the other thing is we wanted to tell you guys about some of the details for tonight. It's the big game cook-off. That's right. Anybody can come. So you can just come and enjoy the game. It really is a lot of fun. It but is. But bring food because that's more fun. Why not? I mean, I don't right. care. Ray might. I don't think he cares. Just set up a grill out there. You just start cooking wings, whatever you need to do. Um, just take your grill with you. Please. You're done. But it's going to be a lot of fun. But if you want to enter in the competition, it's too late. Or it's too late. It's too late. So just come out. Mm -hmm. We close that quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll take Ray's trophy. It'll be great. No. All right. So we'll see you we'll guys. We'll be tonight. taking my trophy. I mean, it's been at least two years since I've had a trophy. Last year, they told me I couldn't compete. So I let somebody else win. This year, I won't be so kind. But you have to come tonight to see about that. Good morning, East Lake. Good morning. To my folks online, good morning to you as well. I'm excited because today we get to revisit a series that we started a year ago called Exit Us. Um, it was actually a walk through the first 19 chapters, I'm sorry, 18 chapters of Exodus. And when we had thought to present this to the body, the Lord was like, here's what I need you to understand. Everybody that comes to church are enslaved to something just like the people of Israel were. They were enslaved to the Egyptians. You might be enslaved to something like drugs, alcohol, pornography, gluttony, gossiping. Things along that line. He said, also, some people are coming to your church that are coming out of those things. And there are other people that are about to enslave themselves to something or their children to something that will take them away from me. 
And so I want to use this word to speak to them specifically where they're at. So when we opened up the series last year, we started with the birth of Moses. We went from that amazing story of Moses being born and then Pharaoh was going through killing the babies, but yet Moses' mom just had it in her heart to just put him in a basket and push him down the Nile because was, he was safer in a crocodile-infested Nile than in her arms. And God's hand was clearly on him because he was delivered into the courts of Pharaoh where he would grow up in that ethos, so to speak. And it was through all of that that Moses would see how the Egyptians lived and also how his own people were being treated. And it came a point to a head that Moses had enough. Moses ended up getting away to the backside of the desert after uh, killing um, some Egyptian soldiers to hide. And he met God out there in that wilderness. And God had a, a vision and a mission for him. And it was not soon after that that we find Moses obediently following God to go back and talk to Pharaoh to convince him to let God's people go. We see all the miracles that God worked. We saw the ten plagues that God had put out on the people of Egypt. But he saved his own people. And then when we brought the series to the close, we saw Moses leading God's people across the Red Sea. And we are now at the point of the new version of Exodus where we're talking about the revelation, where God's people get to learn about who God is. But before we go there, I want to remind you of something that it's important for us to keep in mind as we continue to read through God's word today. So check out this video from a couple of weeks ago. While we all may have been indoctrinated to the belief that God only cared about the Jews, this prophetic word dispels that. He doesn't say just for the Jews. He says to the foreigners, I will bless them. This is one of the things that you learn when you take the class perspectives, that God, since the garden, has been on his redemptive plan for the whole world, for all the nations. He is forecasting that when people from other countries, other cultures come, he will receive them into his place. Were you here for that? In the book of Exodus, God also shows us how this is, again, making an appearance. And the reason why I'm bringing this up, because I never want it lost on us, that God has always been about every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Not just in Revelation 7, which is a part of our mission statement, our vision statement that's on the other side of this wall, but God has always been about this. In Exodus chapter 12, verses 37 through 38, so now I'm going back just a little bit to where we were last year about this one minor detail that's really major where it says this in Exodus 12, 37 through 38. The Israelites traveled from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 able-bodied men on foot. Besides their families, a mixed crowd also went up with them along with a huge number of livestock, both flocks and herds. It wasn't just the enslaved of Egypt that made this journey. There were other people from other cultures, and dare I say, even some Egyptians, that saw the might of God and said, we are out of here. If you desire to follow along today, <clears throat> you have you version. The three bars, click that, hit events, East Lake. You have everywhere I'm going. If you have your own Bible, go to Exodus, the second chapter. I mean, I'm sorry, the second book of the Old Testament. Chapter 19. I'm working through something. If you have one of the orange and white Bibles in the back, <clears throat> that's page 61 and 62. What I hold in my hands is something that many of you have never seen. It's a Bible, but not the one that you grew up with. 
It is the slave Bible. Select parts of the Holy Bible for, those, for the use of the African slaves. Why do I bring this up? If this was the Bible that I wanted to use to preach from today, I'd be okay. Because Exodus chapter 19 and 20 are in this Bible. But that's the only chapters of Exodus in this Bible. There is no book of Psalms in this Bible. There is no books of the prophets, major or minor, in this Bible. The book of Mark is missing from this Bible. The book of Revelations is missing from this Bible. Let me make my point. Over 90% of the Old Testament is missing from that Bible. Over 50% of the New Testament is missing from that Bible. That Bible was used to control a group of people. And if I wanted to preach from it, I could today. Pastor Michelle will be doing um, the Ten Commandments next week. She'd be able to preach from that Bible. But there are 13 other chapters that we'll be navigating, and we wouldn't be able to use that Bible. I'm thankful for the spirit of God that continues to move upon not just the waters, but this world to make sure his whole gospel gets heard. We're at the point in the timeline when God has delivered them across the Red Sea. He's provided for them, I mean, amazingly. Uh, and this is really a wink towards what Jesus would say later when he would tell his disciples not to worry about certain things. Like he said, don't worry about what you will eat or drink. Because in Exodus 16, God gave them manna and expensive chicken called quail. He made sure his people had food. In Exodus 15 and 17, his people were, they would say, dying of thirst. They really weren't, but they just, they wanted something to drink. And God made sure that the bitter waters would turn sweet for them in Exodus 15 and 17. And then also when he talks to them about don't worry about what you will wear, you would find out through the entire book of Exodus that the Lord had preserved even their sandals. They didn't have Birkenstocks or Clark shoes or Toms. They had handmade sandals that lasted them the entire time they were in the wilderness. And so they continued to see how good God really was. And I want you to think about that. How good has God been to you? How has he provided for you this week? What is it that he's delivered you from? Because like I said at the very beginning, he's delivered you here for a purpose. And I think that purpose is a call to relationship. In Exodus chapter 19, um, starting at verse 1, it says, In the third month from the very day the Israelites had left the land of Egypt, they came to the Sinai wilderness. They traveled from Rephidim and, and came to the Sinai wilderness and, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. They're still traveling through the wilderness with Moses as their leader, and he literally brings them to the place that he met God. When Moses was out there tending his father-in-law's sheep, remember the burning bush, and then God told him to take off his sandals and got him to this base of this mountain, and this is where God would meet him, and God would promise him that he would come back to this place, and now he's back with these people. Why? Is it possible for someone to do good towards you and, and, and you not have a relationship with him? That's not a rhetorical question. I mean, is it possible for you to do good things for people and them have zero relationship with you? Absolutely. Sometimes when you're in Starbucks and somebody pays it forward for you, you don't get to meet them. All you get to experience is their grace. God has done the same thing for us. He has lavished us with love, with mercy, with grace, with forgiveness. And dare I say, some of us still don't have a relationship with him. That is a completely transactional relationship. 
You pray, you want him to give you what it is that you want. When he does, you're happy. But outside of that, you're not spending much time with him. You're not really living for him. You're just experiencing the benefits of him. And he is not okay with that, really. No more than you would be okay with your kids not having a relationship with you, but yet rather just taking from you. He wants more than that. Moses had developed an intimate relationship with the Lord all those years in the desert. And he desired, God desired that he would bring his people to him so that they too might develop a relationship with him. So it's at this base that they begin to get a revelation of who God is. So uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 3, Moses went up to the mountain of God and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you would carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples. Although the whole earth is mine and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. So this is Moses' message coming from God that he's to deliver. So Moses that has been refined in obedience to God, to Yahweh, is giving instructions regarding what to say to his people. And Moses, he says it just like God says it. Moses has learned. Obedience is better than sacrifice. He reminds them of God's resume, what God did for them. That it was him that opened up the Red Sea. It was him that caused the ten plagues that they didn't have to um, get the brunt of, that they actually saw happening before them. It was God that had been kind to them. And he says, if you would keep my covenant, that's what Pastor Michelle will be talking about next week in the Ten Commandments. He said, if you can do this, if, if you can keep this, then you'll be my treasured people. You'd you be a kingdom, a kingdom of priests that we would worship and, and, and you, you would we'd minister one to another and you would minister to the world. You would show the rest of the world what it is like to be in a relationship with the creator of the universe. That's why I saved you. That's why you're still here, each of you. He, he, he wants your relationship with him to beam so brightly that everybody you encounter would be infected and affected by your relationship with him. So what's the conditions of this relationship? What is God expecting of us in this relationship? I think this is important because often we don't take time to actually lay a foundation uh, regarding what it is that we expect in a relationship. I mean, do you remember when you met your first friend on the playground? Did you have this conversation like, so here's what I think a friend is. <laughs> what do you think a friend is? I mean, let's, 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 let's graduate this. What about when you were about to date? Did you lay the foundation of what your expectations were? Or were you so lust-filled that you didn't even care until you got knee-deep in it and found out this is not where I'm supposed to be and who I'm supposed to be with? (laughs) Who educated you on what are the foundations of a good relationship? When I um, went to my great cloud of witnesses on Facebook, and I asked them, um, what did you require of people um, to be in relationship with you? This is what some of you said. Uh, um, the, fifth, the, the fifth one that was the most highest rank was honesty. So you don't want anybody lying to you. I get it. Ain't nobody got time for that. The fourth one was loyalty. Yeah, you, you want people that you know are, are your ride or die. That's, that's what I, I call them. 
you know, they, they, they're going to be with you. Thick and thin, thick as thieves, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what southern colloquialisms you guys use to, for, you know, I'm just using what we got in the Midwest. Kindness. Kindness. What's the third one? You want somebody to literally just think well enough of you to say and do things that are considerate of you. It's great. Kindness. Thinking more of you than they are themselves. The second one was understanding. That, that was kind of coded. Understanding meaning compassion, really. To understand that, hey, we, we're going to make mistakes in this relationship. And so let's give each other grace. So I need you to understand when I cuss you out, why I cuss you out. You know, hopefully that's not the people of God cussing people out. But I know the people of God do cuss people out from time to time. I know a few. Um, but you want understanding. You want somebody to be gracious and kind towards you as well. Anybody want to know what the number one was? Anybody? Anybody? Say what? Authenticity. You're the winner. You want somebody that's real. That's not pretentious. That's not trying to put up a front. That is honest about where they are, where you are as your relationship evolves. That's what you're looking for. There were a few other honorable mentions, such as people also wanted somebody that had a sense of humor. They said that was helpful. They said it was really helpful when people are self-aware. Yeah, you don't want nobody delusional, you know, like they think that, you know, the Cowboys are going to the Super Bowl every year. You don't want that person as your friend. Mm. Mm, yeah, I hope, I hope so. You ain't praying hard enough because they ain't in the Super Bowl. Uh, somebody else said that they be that they would have humility and have a teachable spirit. Yes, this is what you want because nobody wants the friend that knows it all. I, I nobody got no. I can't teach you nothing. You can't even learn nothing because you know everything. Some of y'all have those friends. That's why you're laughing. And some of you are those friends. That's why you're not laughing. Somebody else said they should be lovers of Jesus because they're going to talk about him all the time. Please don't be that weird Christian. <laughs> that spiritualizes everything. I mean, Jesus didn't even do that. So, I mean, what are you doing? And, 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 and the last one, and I say the best for last. Um, somebody said, you know, they need to be Steelers fans. <laughs> and somebody just said, absolutely. Let us all pray. I mean, I don't know how you develop relationships, but it's important to lay a foundation on what your expectations are to see if your expectations align with the person that you're going to be in a relationship with. I'm not saying that they need to be the of the same mind as you. There just should be some key foundational things that you can agree upon. And here's what God has to say to his people the revelation of what he wants. Verse 7, after Moses came back, he summoned the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people responded together. We will do all that the Lord has spoken. So Moses brought the people's words back to the Lord. Then the, then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear when I speak with you. There's that transparency. They're not getting it secondhand anymore. They're going to hear it. When I speak with you and will always believe you. Moses reported the people's words to the Lord. And the Lord told Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. They must wash their clothes and be prepared by the third day for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people put boundaries for the people all around the mountain and say be careful that you don't go up to the mountain or touch the base anyone who touches the mountain must be put to death 
No hand may touch him. Instead, he will be stoned or shot with arrows and not live, whether animal or human. And when the ram horn sounds a long blast, they may go up the mountain. Then Moses came down from the mountain to the people and consecrated them and washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be prepared by the third day. And do not have sexual relations with women. Why did God remind them of all that he had done? To simply remind them of his character and who he is. Who he had already proven to them who he was. So that they could actually see he was worthy of putting their faith, their trust, their hope in. Because of all that he had done for them. Which is why they gave the response. We will do all that the Lord has spoken. We're going to later find out they didn't. But they tried. The Lord would continue to set up conditions for this date with dad. He would say they need to wash their clothes. And then talk to them about not having sex with women. And you're like, wait, what? What? Not do, huh? So, so what was this about? God was not only concerned about the outer appearance. He, he wanted them to wash their clothes as an act of obedience. But he also wanted them to purify their inner man through not having relations so that they would be wholly devoted to him. That's what this was about. Right. Paul would later hint to this very same thing in Corinthians when he would make the statement that you are not to abstain from sexual relations unless you are both giving yourselves to a season of prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Same thing, to devote yourself to God's purposes. He details to them how he's going to come to this date. He says that he will come down upon the mountain. Why is this important? Because the gods of this particular age were believed to live on mountains. God is descending upon a mountain. So that means he's coming from someplace else. He is not like the other gods. And just his presence alone consecrates a place. So much so he said, you, you can't touch it. There's a moment that I could have used the MC hammer. Dang it, I missed it. Man, you heard it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. So he would descend upon this mountain. He would tell them, don't touch it, don't come into it. Because he wants them to know he's holy. He's not like all the others. Who all in the room has been to concerts before? Just be real. I ain't going to ask you what concert. Have, have you been to a concert before? All right. Anybody been close enough to be close to the stage? Yeah. All right. We got, okay, we, got, we got people. All right. Which one of you tried to make a dash for the artist that was on the stage? There we go. We got three people in the room. They were those people. You know, every Super Bowl, there is this one person every year. Every year. You're not going to see what this person does. If you watch it close enough, you might catch the tip of something. They undress themselves and they think they're going to be the person to shriek across the entire football field. They, it, it happens every year. It's not been a year this hasn't happened. And they get tackled every time. That was Zeke. I'm just, 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 just joking. Just joking. Just joking. The reason why God made these conditions is because he knew that it would, it would be somebody. It would be somebody. When we were praying, because one of the things that we do every week in, 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 in the prayer station is that we pray over the text that's going to be used that Sunday. And so as we were back in that, uh, uh, that corner praying this past Tuesday about this text, somebody on staff, was they, they said it. There was no way that I would have been able to keep myself from running into that cloud. And I was like, you'd be dead. I mean, God said it. And, and, and check this out. God cared a lot about not just the people in general, but even the person that was running, that, that would be the fool. Because he said, you will be shot with arrows or stoned. Why? Because I don't want to be anywhere near you when this go down. 
So they can throw, they can shoot. The person that's throwing and shooting, they're going to be fine. It's the idiot running into the cloud that's going to meet him that day in an unfortunate way. So after all this is done, after he's laid this foundation, they know who he is, well, what he's done, actually, how he wants them to come to the, to the meeting. Now they have a choice to make. They have a choice regarding this relationship. Are they going to come? Or are they going to stay home? Let's find out on the 16th, verse 16, on the third day when the morning came, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud blast from a ram's horn, just like God said it would be, so that all the people in the camp shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and he went up, and the Lord died directed Moses, go down and warn the people not to break through to see the Lord. I'm reminding, I'm telling you one more time, don't do it. Warn the people not to break through to see the Lord. Otherwise, many of them will die. Even the priests who come near the mountain, who near, come near the Lord, I'm sorry, must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out in anger against them. You're the priest. You are to model the behavior that I want. Because if you remember, I am making you into a kingdom of priests, is what he said. These are just the first. You're just the example. In, in our context, it would be like the elders. The elders are supposed to model the behavior to the people. Because ultimately, I want you doing the same thing in your own spaces. Moses responded to the Lord, the people cannot come up, the Mount, uh, come up Mount Sinai since you warned us. Put a boundary around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord replied to him, go down and come back with Aaron. But the priest and the people must not break through to come up to the Lord or he will break out in anger against them. So Moses went down to the people and he told them. The Lord has laid the foundation. He, he has a barrier. So now for you crazy folks that want to come up to the stage and hug the performer, I've consecrated that too. And I got people there. You can't, you can't get past them. So here's this divine day with dad and cue the thunder and the lightning to show that this God even controls nature. Remember, he was with them in a pillar by day fire by night so that they would light the way for them. It said that they shuddered, and you would too, if the voice of God produced an earthquake. It is a sight and sound spectacular. And God calls the Moses, the people can hear God and hear Moses' responses, and God gives instructions, he gives them back to the people, he says, hey, next time bring Aaron up because Aaron will be the first priest of the nation. This too was a sign of things to come. If you, if you remember, Moses and Aaron are types and shadows of Christ. Christ would be the real redeemer of man and Christ would be the priest of priest to mankind. In Hebrews 4, um, verses 14 through 16, I'll just read to you this little part out of 16. Jesus extends to us a, a greater invitation than the one that we're seeing here at Mount Sinai. Because Jesus would say, let us with privilege, meaning to approach the throne of grace with boldness. You don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to go see a priest to talk to God for you. Because of Christ, you can talk to God yourself. 
It says, with bold, approach it with boldness and confidence without fear so that we may receive mercy and, and find his amazing grace to help in the time of need. So God has proven to us what he's done for us. You realize now that he has brought you thus far because he really does desire a relationship with you. And we realize now that we have this choice to engage this, rest, this, this relationship, this invitation, or not. So it's important for us that we, that we choose right. I mean, every day that you're not choosing him, that says something. And for those of you that think just because you chose him many, many years ago, that settles it. It doesn't. Satan didn't say, oh, man, I let that one get away. And he gives up. No, he is on you every day. He's better than the mailman. He comes early. He gets to work it on you, your spouse, your kids, your cat, anything that he can get his hands on to disrupt you, he's doing it. So you have to choose God every day. And let me show you how you know this to be true. There have been times that people have tested your Jesus. And, and, and what you said, you know what, I'm going to lose my religion. Don't do that. Always choose him. What does he want in this incident? When Peter would write about this many, many years later, in his second chapter of his first letter, he talks about how we are living stones and how we are built, being built up into a holy temple for God. And Jesus is the cornerstone. Can, can, can you have that picture? Now, <clears throat> back in first century, when they would build structures, whether it was a building or a wall, they would take rocks from rock quarries and they would have to, to cut them down to fit into the structure that they're wanting to use. I want you to pay close attention to this picture because on your right-hand side, you see this wall with some bricks that almost look like they're all identical. And that's great. But if you look closer, there are some other ones that are smaller and oblong. On the other side, you have some mixed size bricks. And here's the thing that Peter will be intimating to us in just one moment, that all these things are being used to build a structure. And when he says that we are being built up to be a temple for God, is that when all of these rocks were assembled, every last one of them had to have some cutting on it. Every last one of them. The old bricks were, were, were used to be talking about those that were Jewish. They represent those that have always been God's people. Those are those rocks. The new ones, the smaller ones, are the ones that are different shapes and sizes and colors were, the, were supposed to be the new people, the Gentiles, those that were coming to the faith. And as you can see in this structure, every last one of them are built upon each other. No rock that was used could not be cut. They needed to be cut to fit into what God was doing. This again is talking about how God is taking and using all people. First Peter chapter two, verse seven says, so honor will come to you who believe. But for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone, a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word. That they, they were destined for this is what it says. So like Moses did for the people of Israel, he reminded them of God's resume. Then God displayed his power and his might and his holiness before them. And here's Peter now telling his audience, for those who believe... You'll be a part of this structure that he's building. But for those of you that don't believe, those of you that know what is right to do and don't do it, listen, is this who Christ is to you? That he's the cornerstone? He, he's the one that you have to build your life upon. Any other cornerstone doesn't work. Are you experiencing life where you are constantly stumbling over his word, his will, and his way? Where you are literally hurting yourself to do the opposite of what he wants for you. 
Is he seen as the rock of offense to you, the rock of offense to you, where you're busy trying to live your best life versus a life that is bent on glorifying him? Peter continues, and I want to bring this to a close. But you who are a chosen race, those that believe, your belief is followed by actions. A royal priest to the holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Where were you before he found you? Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, meaning you were completely ignorant of it. You were, you were so busy living in stupidity that you were unaware that it was his mercy that even allowed you to live while you were in your stupidity. But now you have received mercy. Whatever it is that you can identify that you've been delivered from, the purpose of God delivering you from said thing, whether it was an abusive marriage, whether it was an abusive childhood or an abusive church, or was alcoholism, a drug abuse, or porn, whatever it is that you were being delivered from, the point of your deliverance was for his glory and your ultimate good. His glory so that people would see and remember that you used to be and now you're not. Talk to me how this happened. That you'll be a billboard for the Lord. Put that on the shirt, Philip. That you would be a billboard for him. So what's our responsibility to this text where we're being invited into a relationship? It's simple. Choose wisely. That's it. No need for commentary. Choose wisely. Because the word of God is true. You choose the opposite of him. Life will continue to be a struggle for you. I don't understand why my business can't grow because it's not built on Jesus. I don't understand how my marriage isn't because it's not about Jesus. You invited him to the ceremony and did not invite him into the marriage. You even came to his house to have the ceremony. And then didn't, didn't invite him to your house. Now I could go back to Rob Bates because it, it does, it takes two. In a marriage to bring him into the house. Because the house divided will surely fall. Let's pray. Father God, you invite us to the relationships of relationships. The one who created the heavens and the earth wants to know you and wants you to know him better. And God, you give us all the same opportunity to receive you, to learn of your word, to learn of your ways, and to accept you as our Lord and Savior. So I pray for my brothers and sisters today that they would choose wisely not just today and for the one that chooses so today for the first time i pray that they would find themselves either in the prayer corner or take five letting someone know that today i have chosen to surrender my life to the lord our god and that you need help because you are not meant to do this alone for those of us that have been on the battlefield for a long time, God, I pray this is a reminder that we have to choose you every day. And God, I pray for the one whose hearts have been hardened, that you would soften it today, that they would come to know you. They desire to come to know you. We love you, God. Thank you for your grace. Help us now to live out the truth of this text by coming to you humbly. We pray this in Jesus' name, and we all say it.
you so much, Ray. We're going to move into a time of giving and offering and worship all together at the same time. And uh, we'd like to invite you to stand up with us. Our ushers will come forward. We know so many people give different ways throughout the week, and we thank you for it. And uh, it just wants you to know it's going to do great things in our community. And uh, so thank you guys for your generosity. Let's pray for it. God, we lift up the gifts that you provide, and uh, we, we give back to you. Um, and God, we pray that you would allow us to maximize everything, every gift for your purpose, for your will in this community, uh, across the world, everywhere, God. We give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's worship together. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Good stuff. 
Thank you guys for being here, worshiping with us, studying the word with us. It's just good stuff. I hope you had a wonderful morning. If you're new here, I say this every week, so this gets kind of old if you're old here, but we have Take 5 back there in the corner, and that's a space where we want to get to know you if you're new, okay? And then our prayer corner back here, uh, if you'd like us to pray with you. Don't be embarrassed or anything. We pray for so many people. Come back and let us be with you in that, all right? God bless you. See you next Sunday or tonight, whatever. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Boom.